The Wanderings of Odysseus by Rosemary Sutcliffe. This is video four. In video one, we color covered the prologue, the sacker of cities, and the cyclops. In video two, we covered the Lord of the Winds, the Enchantress, and the Land of the Debts. In video three, we covered Sea of Perils, Telemachus Seeks His Father, and Farewell to Calypso. In video four, this video, we will cover the King's Daughter, the Phaeacian Games, and Return to Ithaca. The King's Daughter Now, while Odysseus slept under his coverings of olive leaves on the riverbank, up in the high palace of the king of that country, the princess Nausicaa slept also. And in her sleep, Pallas Athene came to her in the guise of a friend of hers, a sea captain's daughter. She stood beside the bed, seeming half vexed with the half and half laughing, saying, Nausicaa, how does your mother come to have such a heedless daughter? Look at all the beautiful clothes you leave lying about neglected, though you may soon be married, you with every young noble in the land in love with you, and have need of them for your married chest and for guest presents. Let us go down to the river and do some washing in the morning, with a cart to carry the garments. When she woke in the morning, Nausicaa remembered what she thought was her dream, and she went to her father the king and asked him for a mule cart that she might take her linen down to the river for washing. And her father lent her a smooth running cart with a pair of mules harnessed to it. The servants piled in the bright-colored garments, and the queen her mother caused food and wine to be packed in also, and gave her a flask of the softest olive oil that she and her maidens might go bathing and anoint themselves afterwards. And Nausicaa climbed into the cart and took up the reins and drove off toward the river, not too fast, because all of her maidens following on foot. They came to the river and to the clear, shallow pool that was the best place for washing clothes, and there they turned the mules loose to graze. Then they began to wash the garments they had brought, treading them down in the water slides over the broad stones, and when they were rinsed clean, spreading them out to dry in the sun and wind along the bank. While the clothes dried, the girls bathed and rubbed themselves with olive oil, pulling on their loose tunics again, feasted on the fruit and little cakes and honeyed wine that the queen had sent with them. When they had eaten their fill, they began to play with a ball of gilded leather, tossing it from one to another and singing as they played, Nausicaa leading the round song. As they played, Athene of the Shining Eyes joined them in the game unseen, and when Nausicaa threw the ball to one of the maidens running by, she caused it to miss the girl and fall into the eddying currents of the river. Then all of the maidens set up such a laughing and shrieking that the noise they made woke Odysseus from his sleep between the olive trees, scarce a spear throw downstream. For a few heartbeats of time he lay still, half-roused, and thinking by the screams that some dear ne nearby village was being attacked by an enemy or a cruel master was beating his women slaves. But as he woke more fully, the sounds changed in his ears to the squealing of girls at play. Maybe if he asked them, they would give him the help he so sorely needed. He hauled himself to his knees, then to his feet, and breaking off a branch of a wild olive to cover his nakedness, he dragged himself slowly and stiffly out from the riverside scrub. But his feet were bare and bleeding, and his face wild with all that he had suffered, and his matted hair and beard rhymed with sea salt. To the playing girls he looked as fearsome as a lion breaking out of a thicket, and they screamed in good earnest and ran away and ran this way and that, all save the princess Nausicaa, who stood and awaited his coming with wide, grave eyes. And Odysseus, not daring to come close and touch her knees in entreaty, checked and spoke to her from a little distance. O oh, young mistress, are you goddess or mortal maiden? If you are goddess, then surely you must be Artemis of the crescent moon. And if you are mortal, then lucky indeed are your father and your gentle mother, and lucky your brothers also. How their hearts must lift each time they see their darling join the dance. But most happy of all must, happy of all must be the man whose love and wedding gifts win you to his home. Never have I seen such perfection save once on De Delos, a young palm sapling springing beside the altar of Apollo. Yet it is not your beauty but your kindness that I appeal to, for it is only yesterday after many days storm-tossed on sea that some god cast me upon this shore, not knowing where I am or what more of ill fortune may wait for me. Of your mercy give me an old garment to put on, and tell me how to find the nearest town, and may the gods grant you a husband whose heart and mind are one with yours in a happy house. Stranger, you do not seem an evil man, and certainly to judge by your words, you are a gently-mannered one, said the princess. 
It is doubtless the will of Zeus who sends joy and sorrow to each man as he chooses that has brought you to our shores. And being here, you shall indeed have a garment to cover yourself, and I will lead you to the city with good welcome. For I am the daughter of Alcinius, the king of this island, which is called Phaeacia. Then she called to her maidens, who had checked their flight and were hovering at a little distance all about her. What is there to fear, my maids? Surely not the sight of this poor stranger. Do you not know that no enemy ever comes our way, dear to the gods as we are, and islanded on this farmost wash of the waves, where the ships of the world never pass by? This is a wanderer brought here by sad mischance. Come close now, and bring him a garment for his nakedness. So, timidly at first, the girls returned. They brought Odysseus to a loop of the river bank where the crowding alder trees gave shelter from the wind and gave him a mantle from among the newly dried clothes and the oil that remained in the bottom of the queen's flask and bade him wash off the salt sea harshness. Odysseus thanked them for the mantle and the oil, but asked them to leave him, for, said he, I do not like to cast off even this poor garment of green leaves and take my bath before ladies. So they left him and went to tell the princess, and Odysseus washed himself in the sweet water below the bank, rinsing the brine from his body and salt-scurfed head, and rubbed the oil into his skin which had not known its gentleness for many a long day. Into his head too he rubbed the oil, and his hair curled close about it like the petals of the hyacinth flower. Then he put on the mantle that the maidens had given him, and went up from the water's edge and sat down on the bank." And Nausicaa, glancing from afar, saw him sitting there clean and clad and beautiful in her eyes, and she said longingly to her maidens, Could it indeed be that the will of some god that cast him upon here on our shore? When I first saw him, I thought him ugly, but now surely the gods themselves could not be more fair. I wish that it might please him to bide here and become my marriage lord. But come, this is no time for dreaming. Let us bring him food and drink." So they brought Odysseus all that was left of the summer feast that the queen had sent with them, and while he ate and drank eagerly, for he had gone hungry for many days, they gathered up the garments that the sun and wind had dried for them, and loaded them into the cart and harnessed up the mules. Then all was ready for the return, and Odysseus had finished eating. The princess climbed into the cart and took up the reins as before. Then she called to Odysseus, and when he came and stood beside the wheel, she told him, it is time that you come to my father's house. Listen now and do as I say, and all shall turn out well. So long as we are in the farmlands, keep with my maidens behind the cart. But when we draw near to the city and reach the place where there is a fair haven with shipyards on either side of the way, turn aside from us into the grove of poplars sacred to Athene that grow there, and wait a while, that we may enter the city and come first to the palace. For it will not please my father to hear it said on all sides that Princess Nausicaa has been fishing and brought home a man with her. When you judge that the time has been long enough, then come you into the city, and any one will tell you the way to the palace. My father's gates stand at all times open and unguarded, so enter freely, and when you reach our shady courts and halls, make your way to the great chamber. There by the hearth my mother will be sitting at this time of day, spinning yarn of shining sea purple with her maidens all around her. There also is my father's great chair close beside her. But if he is sitting in it, pass him by, and kneel to my mother and clasp her knees and beg her for help, even a ship to carry you to your own country. For if you win her heart toward you, she will give it. Odysseus made her a courteous bowing of the head. All that you tell me that I shall surely do, that I shall surely do. Then Nasika flicked the mules with her whip, and they moved forward, the cart lurching at their heels and Odysseus with all the maidens following on behind. The sun was close to setting when they reached the grove of poplar trees, and there Odysseus turned aside. There was a shrine at the heart of the grove, and kneeling he prayed to Pallas Athene that the Phaeacians might receive him in friendship. Then, when he judged that his wait had been long enough, he rose and made his way into the city. In the city gateway Athene herself met him in the guise of a young maiden carrying a pitcher, and Odysseus asked her the way to the king's palace. For, he said he, I am a stranger here, come from a distant land, and struck by misfortune on my journeying. I will guide you on your way, Athene said. Follow me, but do not try to speak with anyone on the street. Poseidon has made them a sailor folk, but they have little love for strangers who come under their own sail from other lands beyond the seas. So saying, she turned and led the way. Odysseus following at her heels, and no man remembered afterwards having seen him pass, for the goddess had flung a mist of unseeing about him. 
She brought him to the king's gatehouse and pointed him a path through, and when he looked toward her, she was no longer there. Inside the gates, Odysseus paused for a few moments. The palace gardens were rich, rich with fruit trees, pears and pomegranates and apples, with fruit shining among their leaves, olives and figs and loaded vines, all watered by springs whose silvery trickling mingled with the song of birds. But the beauty of the garden would not help him on his way home. Ahead of him he saw a broad white building of many colonnades and courtyards that must be the royal house, and he made his way to it and went in, and still no one saw him pass. In the great hall, the king and his chiefs and counselors were at supper, the queen and her maidens sitting by. Up the hall he went and knelt down at the queen's knee, and as he did so, Athene's mist of unseen wafted away, and a startled silence came upon the crowded hall, as men saw a stranger suddenly in their midst. And in the silence, Odysseus made his plea to the queen. Royal lady, I come before you, a stranger, storm-driven to these shores. "'begging your aid and a ship to carry me back to my own land, "'for it is a long and evil time since I last sat beside my home hearth.' "'Poor man, if we may know your name and what land it is that you are come from,' "'the queen began gently. "'But Alcinius the king said, "'Any stranger is welcome beneath my roof. "'Eat before you answer our questions, and later speed safely on your way.' "'So Odysseus was seated on the polished chair, "'and maidens brought water for him to rinse his hands, "'and the carver set the choicest slices of meat before him "'with fine bread and fruit and wine. "'And he feasted among the rest, rejoicing in the food "'despite the sorrow at his heart, "'for the princess's cakes had done little more "'than blunt the edge of his hunger. "'At last the feasting was over "'and the guests had gone to their own homes. "'Odysseus was left alone with Alcinius "'and Arete, the queen, in the great hall.' The queen was the first to break the silence. Stranger, now that you have eaten and rested a little, forgive if I ask again who you are and where you come from, and how you come to be wearing that mantle which I know well, for it was woven here in the palace. So Odysseus told how he had been driven off course upon his way home from Troy, and how he had been held seven years by the nymph Calypso, until at last she had set him free and allowed him to build a rough boat. How Poseidon, for an ancient grudge he bore him, had wrecked his boat, and how at last he had been cast up on the coast of Phaeacia, and falling instantly asleep in his exhaustion, he had woken to find the princess and her maidens playing close by. How he had begged her for help, and she had given him a mantle from those which they had been washing, and food and drink, and oil to rub himself after he had bathed, and told him how to come to her father's house. One fault I find with my daughter in all this, said the king. She should only have brought you home with her, not left you to find your stranger's way alone. She was, after all, the first person whom you turned to for aid, and your welfare was in her hands. Nay, do I blame her for that, Odysseus said quickly. She did bid me follow among her maidens, but it is so long since I have been among mortal women that I am somewhat shy in their company. Also, I thought that you might be ill-pleased to see her returning with a strange man in her cart tail. The fathers of fair daughters are jealous folk. Alysius smiled, knowing that the guest up and down. I do not think that I am of the jealous kind. To a stranger such as you would be seem to be, I could even think of giving my daughter in marriage, if you were willing to forget this long voyage to some far distant home, and bide here with us in the house that I have built for the two of you. For he clearly saw that this stranger who had not yet told his name was of noble blood, and wise and strong enough to hold a wife at his, in his, at his hearth. Then, seeing a shadow on the stranger's face, the distant look in his eyes, he said, But if your heart is set beyond all changing on returning to your own land, then assuredly a ship will be made ready for you, manned by the best rowers in my kingdom. All that we can speak tomorrow, said Arete the queen. Now it is time for sleep. And she gave orders to her maids to make him a place to sleep with rugs and soft pillows in the inner portico. And there Odysseus slept all night under a purple covering. The Phaeacian Games Next day Alcinius sent word to his people to prepare a ship for sea and have her moored in readiness at the main jetty below the town. At midday the chiefs and captains dined with him in the great hall of the palace, and there while they ate the king's barge sang to them, a man whom the gods had made as sightless as men blind a singing bird to add sweetness to their song. Striking his harp in time to the winged words, he sang of the heroes of Troy, and listening in his seat beside the king, Odysseus pulled a fold of his mantle over his head, as men do in wild weather, or when they wish to shield their faces from the gaze of those about them. 
But Alcinius, being closest to him, knew that he wept. And when the song was finished, rose and said that they had had enough of feasting and harp song and would go now to amuse themselves with running and wrestling and such like sports in open air. So they got up from the table and went out of the gathering place below the palace. The young men hurried to join them, among them the king's three sons, and they fell to racing and wrestling, the long jump and throwing the discus. Then the thought came to them that their guest, who despite being worn down with hardship was built like a wrestler, might care to join them, and Loadamus, one of the king's sons, came to him with their invitation. But Odysseus shook his head, saying that he was too heavy at heart for such games. At that, some of the young men took offense, at, and one, Euralius, by name, laughed sneeringly. Our apologies, apologies, sir. It is clear that you are a traitor, captain of some sow-bellied merchant ship. It was a foolish mistake to think you might be an athlete. At this, Odysseus's head went up, and his brows drew together. Yet I have been in one in happier I've been one in happier times, before I grew old and tired with war and wandering, he said, and it may be after all that something of that yet remains to me. Shall we put it to the test? And getting up without even troubling to fling aside his mantle, he picked up the largest and heaviest of the great bronze discs from where they lay, and whirling about sent it spinning from his hand. The crowd watched the shining arc that it made against the sky, and ran out to mark the spot where it pitched the earth far ahead of any other throw that had been made that day. Then Odysseus, his blood running light and roused within him, challenged any man there to box or wrestle or shoot at a mark with him. But Alcinius, perhaps not wishing to see his young men worsted at every sport in turn, courteously refused the challenge. Let us show you a skill which is ours above all the world, he said, and he called for the blind bard once more to make music for dancing. A wide circle was cleared, and the bard took his stand in the midst of it, while the best dancers gathered about him, and he set their feet moving on the sacred floor in time to a love song of Ares and Aphrodite that he made as light as a summer breeze. Then two of the dancers took a shining ball and began tossing it to each other as they danced, leaping high and throwing it midair and catching it again at the next leap, making the air seem alive as with darting of swallows, while the rest stood around stomping to keep time. This is indeed a skill in which you have no equal. Never did I see the like, said Odysseus. When the dancing was over, Alcinius spoke to his chieftains gathered about him, saying that each of them should make their stranger guest a gift of gold and fine garments before he boarded the ship that waited for him. And that Euralius should take a gift also by way of the atonement for his ill manners during the games. And this they gladly agreed to. The king himself gave a massive cup of, cup of worked gold and a rich mantle and tunic of the queen's own weaving, which Arete packed together in a beautiful coffer of sweet-scented wood, and the chiefs in turn all brought their gifts for carrying down to the ship. Last of all, Euralius brought a bronze sword with a silver hint, hilt and a sheath of age-darkened ivory, and set it at Odysseus's hand, saying with all courtesy, Stranger, I salute you. If I spoke harsh words to you, may the storm winds blow them away, and may the gods bring you safely and swiftly to your own landing beach. I return your greeting, Odysseus said, and accept your atonement gifts. May the gods bless you, and may you never feel the lack of good blade that you have given me. And he slung the strap of the beautiful weapon over his shoulder. Then, the time drawing on towards supper, the palace maidens took him to the bath, and when he had washed himself in the herbs water that they had heated for him he put on fresh garments that they had laid ready and as he made his way back to the hall he met the princess nausicaa standing beside a pillar that upheld the roof of the colonnade it was the first time that they had spoken to each other since they had left the riverside for in that country it was not the custom for unmarried maidens to eat in the hall with the men and it was to be the last time also fare you well my stranger said the princess a little sadly Fair winds carry you on your way. Do not forget me too quickly or too easily in your own country. In my own country, if I indeed come there, Odysseus told her, I will remember you for the rest of my days, for it is you, gentle lady, who gave me back my life. And he went on into the hall and took his place at the feasting beside Al Alcinius the king. Again the bard took his harp and played as they feasted. This time he sang of the wooden horse and how the cunning and resourcefulness Odysseus had caused it to be built and then brought unsuspected into Troy, and of the picked band of warriors Odysseus among them hidden in its belly, who had crept out in the night and opened up to their comrade the gates of the city. And again listening to him Odysseus wept for the sorrows of the siege and the loss of so many friends and sword companions.'
Once more, the king saw his grief and checked the singer with a gift of sizzling boar meat. A thick slice cut from his own portion is a sign of honor. And to the stranger at his side, he said, I noticed that all songs telling the siege of Troy give you much pain. Have you lost a kinsman or a close friend to the Trojan spears? Many, said the stranger, for I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, lord of Ithaca, and of the twelve galley crews that went out with me to the siege. I am the only man now left. A gasp ran around the hall, and a long silence after it, as all men sat gazing at the guest in their midst, for all of them had heard of him in story and harp song, as they had heard of ancient heroes and the gods themselves. The king was the first to break the silence. Then Odysseus, son of Laertes, I pray you tell us of the wanderings that have brought you here, for it has been said this long while past that Odysseus was lost on his way home from Troy, for nothing has been heard of him since his ships left the main fleet. So, sitting there in the midst of feasting and far into the night, Odysseus told the whole story of his wanderings. He told of Cyclops of Circe and his voyage to the underworld, of Scylla and Charybdis, the cattle of the sun, the loss of his remaining ships, and when he came at last to Calypso's island, where the story caught up with what he had told them already. Before dawn, the feasting and the storytelling being over, all the treasure of gold and rich garments was carried down by torchlight to the waiting ships and stowed beneath the rowing benches. Odysseus took his leave of the king and queen who had come down to see him on his way. To arete the queen, as he gave the journey cup back into her hands, he said, My queen, good fortune to you all your life, until old age and death come to you as they come to all mortal kind. May your house be blessed, and may you be happy in your children and your people and Alcinius your lord. Then he went on board and laid himself down wrapped in warm cloaks and rugs, while the rowers thrust the galley off, then settled to their oars and set her forward through the parting waters to far off Ithaca. Return to Ithaca When Odysseus woke from the long, deep sleep that Athene had cast upon him, he found himself alone, lying under an olive tree and still wrapped in the bright cloaks in which he had lain down on board Alcinius' galley, and all his rich gifts stacked about him, a thick morning mist spread by the bright-eyed goddess blotted out the shades of the shapes of the land, that he might not know himself back on his own island and start out for his home before she could warn him of what was happening there. So he thought that the Phaeacians had set him aside in some strange place, and he checked over his treasure, drawing out the silver-hilted sword to sling over his shoulder, and fell to pacing up and down the shore while he thought of what he should do next. And there, on the seemingly empty tide line, Pallas Athene came to meet him in the guise of a young man, clad in a double mantle such as kings and nobles wore, and carrying a spear on his hand, in his hand. The greetings of the morning to you, said Odysseus, not knowing her. I pray you, tell me what this land is, and are the people friendly in these parts? Truly, said Athene, you are simple in the head to ask such a question. This is the island of Ithaca, whose name is known even as far afield as Troy. Then a great joy woke in Odysseus at finding himself back in his own land. But he had been long away, and had no way of knowing what kind of men the children of nineteen years ago had grown into, or what kind of greeting they would have for him. Maybe a new king sat in his place, who might not even be his son. So he did not tell the young man who he was, but said he was a Cretan, and then to explain how a man of Crete came to be in Ithaca, with his treasure, treasure stacked around him under an olive tree, and yet not know where he was, he launched into one of his long, detailed stories, telling how in Crete one of the king's sons had tried to rob him of rich spoils of war that he had brought back from Troy, how in the fight for it he had slain the prince, and how in fear for his own life he had gathered up his treasure and escaped on board a trading ship of the Phoeacians, who had promised to put him ashore at Pylos. But the wind had blown them off course, and they had landed and slept here, and in the morning must have gone on their way, leaving him still asleep. At this the young man laughed, and in that instant he was gone, and in his place stood bright-eyed Athene, stately and beautiful. Oh, the cleverness of Odysseus, said she, mocking. Yet you did not know me, who have so often helped you before Troy, and again in the land of King Alcinous. Alcinous? Odysseus gave her a straight look eye to eye. But not when I had sore need of help during my times of hideous danger at sea. Then how may be I sure that you now stand my friend? How can I even be sure that I have indeed returned to my own island? Athene said, How could I go against my father's brother Poseidon, lord of the sea, whose wrath was hot against you for the blinding of his son? But all that is past. Now you stand upon your own shore, and I am free to help you as I will. 
Look about you, and you will see that this is indeed your island. As she spoke, the grey cloud all about them rolled away as morning mist is drawn up by the sun, and Odysseus saw the familiar shapes of the land he knew and loved, the curve of the bay within its headlands, the wooded upthrust of the mountains that rose almost from the shore, and little more than a bowshot away, the cave of the sea nymphs, its entrance shielded by silvery-leaved olive trees, and with a heart that felt near to choking him, he flung himself down on his knees and kissed the sandy earth of home. But soon his joy turned to anger as Athene told him the sad state of land that he had come back to, and the sorrows of Penelope, and how at present she had not even their young son to help her hold off her swarmer, swarming suitors. For Telemachus was gone to seek news of his father from Menelaus and Helen of the fair cheeks. Sweet lady, tell me what I must do, for my wits fail me, Odysseus cried, kneeling still with his face bowed into his hands. First... Let us hide all this treasure before men see it and start to wonder as to its meaning, said Athene. So they carried all the gold cups and fine garments into the cave, and she closed the entrance with a stone. Then she cast a spell of disguise upon Odysseus, so that his good clothes turned to rags with half-bald stag skin over all the way of a cloak, and she wrinkled his skin and made his eyes dull so that he seemed again the beggar who had stolen into Troy to carry off its luck. Now she bade him, Go you across the island to the farm of Eumaeus, your swineherd. He is old now, but still loyal to you. Bide there among the pigs while I go fetch home Telemachus. And she was no longer there, only a quiver in the air behind her, and Odysseus turned his face toward the mountain tracks that led inland. When he reached the farm, Eumaeus was sitting in his doorway making himself a new pair of oxide brogues. His dogs ran out barking at the stranger with their hackles up, and would have attacked him, but that their master ran up and drove them off with a shower of stones. He greeted the seeming beggarman kindly, and brought him into his own hut at the head of the farmyard, and gave him food and rough wine, and afterwards, being glad of someone to talk to, he told him of the loss of his king, his master, and the haughtiness and greed of the young ruffians making them itself at home in the palace, and trying to force themselves upon the queen in marriage." The swineherd had loved his master, and the story had become a deep grievance with him, which in the way of old men he told over and over again to anyone with ears to listen. Odysseus listened as well as he might, and when the story was over, he promised the old swineherd that his master was alive and would soon be returning home, for he had heard of him on his wanderings. Eumaeus did not believe him, for he thought that the beggar was only telling what he thought he would like to hear. But he listened courteously, and later, when the herd lads returned from the grazing land, driving the pigs before them, it was time for supper, and he fed him a good meal of roast pork, as much of it as he could eat, and afterwards Odysseus amused them all with tales of the Trojan War until it was time for sleep. Meanwhile, Athene was in the palace of Menelaus, standing beside Telemachus, as he lay wakeful in the night, troubled for his mother and wondering, wondering how things went at home. She told him that his mother had at last weakened and promised to marry one of the suitors, and that he must sail at once if he would keep her from doing so. Take a different seaway home from the one that brought you here, she bade him, for Antinous with a vast galley awaits you under the bluff of the same, eager to have your life. When you reach Ithaca, send your rowers on to the town, but you yourself must walk alone across the island to the farm of Eumaeus, your swineherd, who is still loyal to you and your father. So in the morning Telemachus and his friend Pisistrus took their leave of Menelaus and Helen, who made them rich parting gifts of a golden cup and a silver mixing bowl. And Helen brought out a silken robe, the fairest of all that she herself had embroidered, and gave it to Telemachus's hand, saying, a gift for me, dear boy, for your bride, to wear when the day comes. Meanwhile, let it lie in your mother's care. All joy go with you in Helen's love. Just as they were on the edge of leaving, their chariot standing at the palace gates, and the horses impatient fidgeting under the yoke, an eagle came swooping from the mountain's heights. He snatched up one of the white geese that were feeding on the grass nearby, swerved away with it low across the chariot's horses, then upwards and away. An omen, surely! But is it for you, my lord king, or for us too, said Pisistris, Pisistris, watching it grow small in the sky. For you surely, said Helen of the fair cheeks. Wait, and I will prophesy what the great ones put into my heart. As the eagle came down from the wild mountain heights and made it an end of that fat farm-reared goose, so shall Odysseus return from the wilderness years and take vengeance on those who grew fat around his hearth. Telemachus thanked her for her words of good omen, and mounting into the chariot beside Pisistrus, Pisistrus uh, 
set out on the road home. The next day they came to Pylos. Pisistris drove straight down to the harbour and set Telemachus down there with his guest gifts, for he did not wish to come again to Nestor's palace, fearing that the good old man would seek to make him stay. He called up his rowers and went on board and set sail for Ithaca. And when they made landfall, he sent his crew on down to the coast, the coast to town, as the Lady Athene had ordered, and himself walked up into the hills toward the swineherd's farm. Odysseus and the swineherd had just roused up the fire to make the morning meal when a young man came in through the farm gate and the dog ran to meet him, yelping and fawning on him as he crossed the yard. The swineherd leapt up with a shout, oversetting the bowl in which he had been mixing wine and water, and ran to meet the newcomer. And looking after him, Odysseus saw, just as Helen had seen it, the strangers likened it to himself and to old Laertes. And he knew, his breath catching in his throat, that this was the son he had last seen as a babe in his mother's arms when the black ships sailed to Troy. The swineherd was hugging Telemachus like a long-lost son, and Telemachus was thumping on the old man's back and demanding to know of whether he was in time to stop his mother's marriage, both of them talking at the same time, as Eumaeus dragged him into the hut. Odysseus, mindful of the beggar's guise, would have clambered to his feet as the young man crossed the threshold, but the prince bade him sit down again, saying, There's room enough in this place for two guests to sit beside the fire. Eumaeus brought an armful of brushwood and spread a fleece over it, for the latest corner, cold comer. So they sat, all three of them, and made their morning meal of old cold pig meat and wheat and bread and wine in an ivy wood bowl. And while they ate, the prince and the swineherd discussed what was to be done with the old beggar, who seemed to be so far gone into himself and so taken up with the food that he might as well have not been there at all. In the end, they decided that Telemachus could not well take such a tattered creature to his mother's house, lest he should suffer insult and ill usage from the rabble of young men there. So Eumaeus should keep him at the farm, the prince sending up clothes and food that he might not be a burden there. Then Telemachus bade the old, bade the old swineherd to go to the palace and find means to tell his mother, the queen, that he was safely back from his journey. He was scarcely gone on his errand when the dog sprang up, whimpering and crept up their tails down into the furthest corner of the hut, as bright-eyed Athene appeared in the doorway. Telemachus did not see her, only Odysseus and the dogs, who knew that some great presence was amongst them and were afraid. Odysseus went out to the goddess, and she bade him tell his son who he was. Now that they were alone together, and touched him with the golden rod she carried, instantly returning his true seeming, and his rags became the kingly garments that is fitting for him to wear, and he turned and went back into the hut. Telemachus, looking up from beside the fire, saw the change in him and sprang up. Stranger, he said in awe, you are greatly altered from the old man who went out a moment since. Surely you are one of the immortal gods. No god, Odysseus told him, but your father come home at last in beggar's guise to escape men's knowing, and now return to his own form by the lady of the bright eyes. Telemachus shook his head. You are not my father. You could not be. And then, I pray you, if you are not Odysseus, do not make our grief the more bitter by pretending. No pretending, his father said. Believe this, and do not look for the coming of any other man. For I am Odysseus, and there is no other, nor ever has been. Then Telemachus let himself believe, and the two flung their eyes, arms about each other, weeping for joy. In a while, sitting down again, Odysseus told his son as swiftly as might be of his wanderings, and the gifts of the Phaeacians hidden in the sea nymph's cave. And with the story told, he asked for details of the suitors, what numbers they had to deal with, and how they were armed, and the like. One hundred and eight, Telemachus told him, and with them a faithless servant of his own and the royal harper, whom they had taken and forced to sing for their feasts. They were all strong young men who had brought their swords with them for their wooing, but no shields or body armor. These are odds indeed, said Odysseus, but I do not doubt that we shall overcome them, for we have the Lady Athene for our friend, which is worth many men with swords. So they fell to working out their plan of action. Telemachus to his return the next morning, and however badly the suitors behaved toward them, he must not allow himself to be drawn into any kind of open quarrel. And later in the day, Odysseus would come down in the beggar's guise and join the household, and when the right moment came, he would give Telemachus a sign to take down the shields and helmets and fine weapons that hung on the walls of the great hall and hide them away in a safe place. And what shall I say if that lordly rabble misses them, the son asked. Say first that the smoke of the fire was spoiling them, and if they ask again, say that they are better out of the way, lest your mother's guests should grow quarrelsome in their wine. And they laughed together. What else, Telemachus asked. Odysseus said, 
Only remember to let no man or woman know that the old beggar in the corner is more than he seems.